Uh, Joshua 2, I'll be reading a little chapter. Then Joshua said to Nun, or son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shmitang. Go and look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men that came to you and enter your house because they have come to spy out the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the gate, the men left. I didn't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under stacks of flax she had laid on the roof. So the men set out to pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the sp spies laid down for the night, she went up to the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a greater fear of you has fallen upon us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the Shimon and Org, the two kings of the Ammonites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and every man's courage fell because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you may save us from death, our lives for your lives. The man assured her, if you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So <clears throat> she let them down by the rope through the window, for the house was, she lived in was part of the city wall. Now she had said to them, go to the hills, so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. The men said to her, this oath you made us swear to will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your family into your house, if anyone goes outside your house into the streets, the his blood will be on his own head. We will not be responsible. As for anyone who is in your house with you, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid to him. But if you <clears throat> tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you have made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. May God bless his word. Thanks, Sam. That's good to be back. It's good to see everyone here. And uh, it's a beautiful day outside, even though it's going to rain some. So I just am, am uh, ecstatic to be here. Title of the message today. I should turn this on here. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's a little better, huh? The title of the message today is Faith or Works. I know someone who says he's a believer in Jesus Christ. He never reads the Bible, never goes to church. He was baptized by immersion. 
He proclaimed Jesus as his Lord and Savior. I know another person who attends church every Sunday, works in the ministry of the church, spends time with people in the church who are homebound, gives generously, gives a testimony to those that would hear and loves Jesus. I know of another person who gave their life to Jesus, quit their job, sold what they had, went to seminary, pastored a church for two years, grew that church by four times in numbers, left the church after some conflict, went to work in the private sector and never led a church again. Three different people, all calling themselves Christians. Paul says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Period. It's Romans 10.9. So that's all I have to do, right? Believe that Jesus is Lord and tell someone else that he is Lord one time and go on with my life. That's faith. I believe it's good enough. There is one word used here that proves the saving faith. There is one word here that drives the desires of the heart and mind to do the good work of Jesus. One word we're going to focus on today. Why Rahab? What does it have to do with today's message? Actually, the message today comes out of James 2. Okay? James 2. But Rahab is a perfect example of this message. So what is the message? What does it mean, faith or works? You know, this is a division that has divided the church for a long time. Is it works that I get to heaven? Or is it faith? Which one is it? Which one? Rahab. She's a prostitute who lives in Jericho. A well-known prostitute, as we know, the king sent word to her. She wasn't perfect. She wasn't perfect. She lived in a house on the outer wall of the city of Jericho. Now, that sounds pretty interesting to have a house on the outer wall, but you know here it's half. It's your house first, right? It's your house first. So I don't know if that was a good part of Jericho or a bad part, but it's probably not a part that I want to buy houses. She hid two spies from the nation of Israel. And she let the spies down a rope to escape. We could stop the story right there. Okay? That's Rahab. That's who she is. But there's so much more to this story. Because it goes on to a conversation that Rahab with the spies, that Rahab had with the spies. What else did we know? She knew where the spies came from. It's Shiloh, and it means uh, the land of the acacia trees. That's what it means. It's east of the Jordan. Jericho is west of the Jordan. She knew about the parting of the Red Sea and the destruction of Egypt's army. She knew about that. Now, this is amazing. This is a long, long time ago. Right? How did she know? You know, I'm sure that it spread from one village to the next village to the next town to the next kingdom to this kingdom to that kingdom. Every kingdom's going. Every king in that kingdom's going. Man, I hope you don't come here. Right? That's what he's thinking. There is power in God. There is power in his works. She knew about the destruction of the Amorite kings east of the Jordan. She knew the Lord has given his people the land of Jericho. She knew all these things. What did she know most? She knew it wasn't the people. It wasn't the Israelites. It was the power of their God that is going to give them the land. That's what she knew. And that's amazing. So here's Rahab. She doesn't know anything about 
the custom of the Israelites or the Ten Commandments or anything. She doesn't know anything about that. But what she knows is the power of God, the power of the Almighty, the power of God who split the Red Sea and let the Israelites cross and then brought the water back in to destroy the army of the Pharaoh. She knew the Lord was the God of heaven and earth. I'm sure that in that time in Jericho, there were other idols. There was a God of this and a God of that because we all create gods. We all create idols in our lives, right? But she knew there was a special God. There was a God that was so powerful that he led a people. She knew this. We can look at this and say, well, Rahab just helped the spies so that her household would not be destroyed by the Israelites. We could say, well, she knew, and she had, a, she had this plan, right? She was kind of conniving. She had this plan, and she's saying, you know, Rahab is saying, you know what? I'm going to make a deal with these spies, and I'm going to make a deal with them. And I, I don't really believe it, but I'm going to make a deal with them anyway, and I'm going to try to save my household. But the scripture goes on to say, Rahab's heart was melted by fear of the Lord, the God of Israel. Her heart was melted by the fear of God, the God of Israel. Fear of the Lord God. Who can stand against the Lord? Who can stand? Rahab's courage, Rahab's courage failed because of the Lord God, her courage failed. She feared the Lord and her courage failed. The people's courage failed them. They knew that no matter what they did, they weren't gonna be able to stand against it. Please swear to me by the Lord, says Rahab. Don't swear to me by your words. Swear to me by the word of the Lord. Swear to me by that, and then I'll know. Swear to me that you'll protect my household. Rahab asked for kindness from the Israelites, but really, she asked for kindness from God above. Rahab asked for grace from the Israelites. But really, she asked for grace from God above. That's what she did. That's amazing. Rahab knew that salvation for her family came by way of the Lord of Israel, the Lord God Almighty, who has the power to save. She didn't go anywhere else, she didn't run away. She knew the only power that could save her was the God of Israel. The only power. The only God. Why this scripture? What does it have to do with this message? Remember, the message is faith or works. What's it have to do with it? Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that no one may turn away the snares of death. Rahab's first thing was she feared the Lord. You know, in our own walk, in our own days, there's part of us, if we don't know Jesus Christ, that fears God. You can't deny it. When you talk to people that don't know Jesus Christ, they say, well, you know, I'm a good person, and, and I go and do these things, right? And, you know, really, I'm basically a good, a good person. Why would you say that if you fear God? Why would you say that? Why would you even try to make an excuse of why you're a good person? It's because you fear the Lord. See, there's a part of every one of us that fears God. There's a part in every single person that's born, that part that knows that they need this relationship. They don't know what it is. Paul says faith is enough. 
Paul says faith is enough. You know, back in uh, Romans 10, 9, Paul says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Did Rahab do that? Well, she didn't know Jesus, but she believed, she believed in the Lord. She had fear of the Lord. Paul says faith is enough, and we know that in Luke 23, 39 through 43, you want to write that down, Luke 23, 39 through 43, the thief on the cross saw paradise that day. The thief on the cross saw paradise that day. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. When he said, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. You will be with me in paradise. The thief feared God. The thief knew who Jesus was. The other thief said, well, aren't you the Messiah? Saying, well, if you're not the Messiah, you can't be the Messiah if you don't save us and yourself. But the thief that ended up in paradise understood who Jesus really was. He understood that Jesus was the Messiah, and he rebuked the other thief for saying that. He knew who he was. Remember me, he said, when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. What's he saying? He's saying Jesus is Lord. Because you can't have a kingdom if you're not a lord. You're not a king, you can't have a kingdom. But Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. You know what's amazing? Think about this a minute. That thief that was nailed to the cross behind Jesus is in paradise, is in heaven today. Today, 2,024 years later, 2020, well, 2,000 years later, let's say that. We don't know the exact date. Right here today, he's in paradise with Jesus Christ, and it's available to all of us who believe. All of us. But in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus says, this is, a, this is an interesting scripture here. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons, and in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. What day is Jesus talking about? What day? It's the day that we stand there in front of Jesus, the day that we meet this earthly place, and our soul ends up in heaven. That's the day. And what does Jesus say? He says to these people, I never knew you. But these people did all these works. They did all this. They prophesied in the name of Jesus. They stood up and said, in the name of Jesus this, and in the name of Jesus that. And they cast out demons in his name. They knew who he was. Even demons know who Jesus is. Even Satan knows who Jesus is. It's more than knowing who Jesus is. You have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. This very 
intimate relationship, the word for know that Jesus uses here, is the same word used for the intimate relationship that a husband and wife have. That's the word. So, can works get me to heaven? Can they? Yes or no? Depends where your heart is. It depends on what's inside. It depends what relationship you have with Jesus Christ. Faith or works. If you would, turn with me to James. Oops, I'm sorry. We're not quite there yet, but turn with me to James 2, 14 through 26. James 2, 14 through 26, and let's see here. I had it marked down. In the large print Bible, the big Bible, it's page 1722. And in the small Bible, it's page 855, or you can plug it into your phone. James 2, 14 through 26. But before we get there, why don't these people that prophesied in his name, that cast demons on in his name, that healed in his name, that did miracles in his name, why don't they get to heaven? Why don't they get there? The key word, I never knew you. I never had fellowship with you. I never had an intimate relationship with you. I never knew you. Words that should stir the mind to repentance. Words that should wake the soul. Words that will condemn the heart. Words no one wants to hear. What do all these scriptures have to do with today's message? We're going to go to James 2, 14 through 26. But first, I want to tell you a story. I preached this message, not this message, but I preached on this scripture one time before in my life. And it was about, uh, it was probably 10 years ago. It was at another church in Ashtabula. And the Lord laid James 2, 14 through 26 on my heart. And I knew this is the message that I had to preach in this congregation. But it was odd. It was just filled in one day for a pastor who was on vacation. And it was odd. It's like, why am I preaching this message? This is a tough message, right? It's not really a message that you would preach to just come out on a Sunday and just, you know, give a message to fill in for someone. Why did he lay it on my heart? I couldn't figure it out, and I really struggled with it. And it was a good message, and it was it was right to the point. Paul and I were in Sunday school. I don't know if she remembers this or not, but we sat in Sunday school, and we got there early, and so we sat in one of the Sunday school classes, and they were studying. I don't even remember what scripture we were studying on it. One of the head deacons comes in. And he's going around all the Sunday schools, and he's saying, look, I just want everybody to know that we had a homeless family sleeping in our clothing bin. You know those sheds that you have outside the church that people throw their clothes in? This is the third time that I called the police. This is the third time that I called the police. He didn't know what the message was, but God knew. God knew what the message was. Now you think about that as we read James 2, 14 through 26. I'm going to read out of the NIV. The title is Faith and Deeds. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Question mark. Suppose my brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. 
You believe there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac to the altar? You see that his faith and his actions are working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Wow, that's a wake-up call for all of us, you know, and me included, right? Because there are many times that I should do something and I don't do it. You can talk my life and show that you all lie. <laughs> right? She knows me. She knows me as good as Jesus knows me. There are times that I should do something and don't do it. And I feel guilty about it. Why do I feel guilty about it? Because the Lord Jesus Christ is living inside of me. And he's saying, Don, you really should do that. And I feel it. Right? I feel that disconnection. So, which is it? Faith or works? Do we need faith? And what is saving faith? James connects all the dots. James crosses all the T's. James dots all the I's. No food and little clothing. Person's very poor, right? We just talked about, uh, Holly was talking this morning about the benevolence fund of the church, right? You know, that goes... Deacons spend that, at least in the church that I come from, the, the deacons spend that to help people, right? That's what it's for. But I'm going to suggest to you that it's, it's good to put money in the benevolence fund, but it's even better to be out there doing the work. Okay? So I'm, say, I'm not saying it's bad to, to do one or the other, because both things are needed for the ministry of a church, for the church to be alive and to be growing, right? That's what it is. It's what brings people to church because they see the church in the world. That's what it is. <clears throat> so we come to a person that has no food and little clothing and they're very poor and we say, go and be well. By the way, can you come to church on Sunday? Or how about keep warm? By the way, we're studying the book of John in Sunday school. Keep well fed. Hey, why don't you come to Wednesday night? We're having a concert. I know you're hopeless, homeless. I hope it works out. By the way, boy, it'd be good if you took a bath. Oh man, you got a drug, pro drug problem? Boy, I'm really sorry. I'll pray for you. Can't pay your rent? Boy, you know, I was there one time. You know what I had to do? I, I had to get a smaller house and get another job. Things that are said, things that are thought, because we're all human, right? We really are. You know, on a, when I was at in Ashtabula, as interim out there for, for a year and a half, there's a huge homeless population in Ashtabula. Okay, and, and it's really sad. Most of it's, you know, drug problems, and there are, there are many churches that are helping out. There, there's a lot of things, but we had a lot of homeless come on Sunday, right? Because there wasn't any other place open, so they came to the church. One person just got everything stolen from them. They didn't have anything. It was, it was end of November. It was snowing and raining. 
They came inside, they were soaking wet. And you know what? You know what? I saw one of the first two people at the church did. They ran home and dug through their closets and brought back a whole bunch of clothes. Church didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a place to put them, but we could at least give them something to eat more. It's what it's about, you know. I don't know where it was. There's no question there's two kinds of faith. No question. What is it that all these people have in common? Their deeds could not be accomplished without faith. Show me your faith without deeds. And I'll show you faith by my deeds. I'll show you faith by my deeds. Isaiah 6, 6, or 64, 6 says, All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like, like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins swept, us and our sins are swept away. We all, that's why we need Jesus, because we can't do it alone. If I came here every day, every single day, and I mowed the yard, and I leave the beds, I came in, I back and forth, I never gave my life to Jesus Christ. I'm going to be one of those people that he says, I never knew you. It's sad. It's sad. Because there is nothing that I can do to be righteous enough to get to heaven. I have to believe that what Jesus did for me is what gets me to heaven. Because Jesus is the only righteous one. He's the only righteous one. I'll show you my faith by my deeds. There's no faith without deeds, but there are deeds without faith. I'm a good person. Why do I need Jesus? I get to the homeless shelter. Why do I need Jesus? I mow my neighbor's lawn. Why do I need Jesus? I'm basically a good person. Why do I need Jesus? You know, I've talked to tons of people, and those are excuses that I've heard that don't know Jesus. Why do I need him? The answer is because I can't be righteous by myself. I can't do it. All deeds done without faith that mean absolutely nothing, nothing to God. All filthy rags to the throne of God. Any good deed that man can do without the Spirit, without Jesus Christ, is like a filthy rag to God. The will of the Father. What is the will of the Father? You see, when we have faith, we do the will of the Father. This is for sure. Okay. And so, what is that will? What is the will of the Father? Jesus was asked, What's the greatest commandment? Remember that? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself. It's what it is. It's that simple. It ain't the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments are all wrapped up in that. If I love God first and then love my neighbor second, I'm good. But you know what? I can't do it without knowing Jesus Christ. I can't, I can't do it. I try. I'm good sometimes, but I can't do it all the time. And even if we know Jesus, sometimes we don't do it all the time, right? But we have a God that is filled with grace and loves us like we love our children. So instead of saying, I'm a good person, 
We could say, sure, I'll cut you on. Sure, I can give you a ride. Sure, I can find you a place to live. As a matter of fact, why don't you stay with me for a while? Food, I have plenty. Even if I don't, I'll share what I have. This is the kind of faith that saves. No question, there's no two kinds of faith. There's a false faith and a saving faith. And the saving faith is proven by the works that we do for God. There's only one kind of faith that saves. It's a faith that produces in us the will of the Father. It is a faith that rises up from the very depths of our soul and says, I do because Jesus did for me. I do because Jesus did for me. It's a faith that shows the love we have for God to our closest friends and distant enemies. It's a faith that shows the love we have for our neighbors. It's a faith that changes us and the world around us. The saving faith that gives life for eternity. You want Jesus to come? Do you want Jesus to say, come into my house because I know you? Give your life to Jesus. It's the answer. And when you do that, you're filled with the spirit and this peace and this love that is so overflowing that you become a light to the world around you. And the deeds that you do become the deeds of Jesus in this world. That's what it is. That's how it works. So there aren't any two kinds of faith. There are some denominations that believe that works will get you to heaven and you just keep track of this and that and you know, how many hours you spend here and how many hours you spend there and you get this point system. Don't work that way. And what the Bible says, it only works when you give your life to Jesus. It only works when you give your life to Jesus. So if you don't know Jesus today, come and talk to me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are all powerful. You, Heavenly Father, created all of us. You, Heavenly Father, created the earth that we live on and the trees and the blooming flowers and the grass that grows too much. And Heavenly Father, you created Rahab and you created Abraham and you created the spies. And Lord, as we review your word today, we understand that it is by faith alone that we come to you. It is by faith that you make us righteous, but that faith must, Lord, be proven in, the, in deeds, Heavenly Father. We know, as we know with our own children, that if they say one thing and do another, Heavenly Father, then they really don't know what they're doing. But Lord, we know that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die a horrible death on a cross, cross, with two thieves behind him that deserved to die. And even though your son was hanging on the cross, he saved the thief behind him. And today, they share eternity with you in heaven. Lord, we know this and we desire it. Heavenly Father, fill our hearts with your grace so that we can be grace in the world. Heavenly Father, fill our hearts with mercy so we can be mercy in the world. But most of all, Heavenly Father, fill us with love so that we can be your agape love in the world. Lord, we ask this in your son's holy name, Jesus Christ. We're singing a, a yeah, we're doing communion. So we've come to our time of communion. And after this message, I really want us to take a moment and just, uh, we're going to just pray in silence and, and just, uh, you know, seek the Lord. Seek his will for our lives. Seek his will for you. So let's just take a moment of silence and then, <clears throat> then we'll come to communion.
Heavenly Father, we know that uh, it's your blood and your body that was given for us, Lord. We know this, and, and today, Lord, we, we understand what you did for us, and Lord, we want to be in that communion with you. Lord, we ask this today, that you love us like you first loved us. Amen. Okay, our uh, scripture reading for communion will be uh, in the uh, Blue Hymnal uh, 942. Blue Hymnal 942. All right here. And we're going to all read it together. They will all read it together. Number 942. Are we going to sing first? What's that? Are we going to sing first? Oh. Well, actually, it's not that way in the... Uh, in the hymnal or in the uh, bulletin. There's a song right before. Oh, I'm sorry. Come share the Lord. 568. Communion heaven. Very good, Linda. See, I'm not even perfect. Yeah, number 568. I'm sorry. together. Lord God, we are glad to come here today. Gladly we come to give you thanks for everything you have done for us. But we are most glad thank you, and to what you say to us. But we are most glad and thankful because you have invited us to come to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. We now worship you, that we do not live as we ought to live. We do not deserve to be here at all. Lord God, forgive us. Pour out your Holy Spirit into our lives to give us peace and the strength to leave self behind. Take up the cross and follow Christ today, tomorrow, and always. In his name we ask, amen. On that night, they were celebrating Passover. Passover was, was celebrated 
to remember what God did for the Israelites in the land of Egypt. Remember, it was the 10th plague, and the Lord sent the angel of death into the land that night to kill the firstborn of every family in the land. But the Israelites had instruction to slaughter a lamb and splash his blood on the doorpost. And when the angel of death came, it would pass over that house. And as Jesus sat there with his disciples celebrating Passover, he said to them, as he took bread and broke it, as he took bread and broke it, can't get it. I got this one. I'm sorry. You know, the bread that they used was matzo bread. It was unleavened bread. I had. It was unleavened bread. Okay. And if you've ever seen matzo bread, it's pierced. It looks like a saltine cracker. And it's burned where it's grilled. And when you look at it, and Jesus holds that, up, that bread up, and he says, this is my body which is broken for you. He's saying, this is my body which is pierced for you. This is my body which is bruised for you. This is my body which is broken for you. That's what he said that night. So that night, Jesus held up the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then during dinner, when it came time for the cup, it's actually the third cup that's used at the Passover meal. It's called the cup of redemption. Jesus held up that cup. And he said, this cup is my blood in a new covenant poured out for many. <clears throat> Do this in remembrance of me. Our closing hymn is a song that's found in your bulletin, in the handout. It's not actually in our hymnals. And we haven't sung it before. I haven't sung it before. <laughs>